All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ariel. Um, I am an admission counselor here. I am a counselor for Portlanders and for Northeasterners. So you may have been getting emails from me. I recognize some names in our attendees, which is wonderful. So it's great to see everyone or look at everyone. Um, I have two wonderful colleagues here from the um, residence life, and they are going to be able to talk a little bit about residence life and answer any of the questions that you may have. And I'll hand it off to Cade, if you'd like to introduce yourself and, and whatnot. Sure, uh, I think we're actually gonna start with Sarina. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, yes, both Kate and I are really excited to chat with you all uh, this afternoon. Um, my name is Serena, uh, and I use they them pronouns. I'm one of the area coordinators here at Reed. Um, and a little bit later on, I'll talk a little bit about what an area coordinator at Reed is and how students interact with them. Um, but for now, I'll pass it to Kate. Cool. Thanks, Serena. Yeah, name's Cade, pronouns are he, him, his. I'm the operations coordinator. So today I'm going to be talking about the operations side of residence life and how we kind of organize things to support you. And also spending some time walking through your housing application because some of you have already taken that, that action or some of you are really excited to be taking that action. So we're going to reserve some time to talk through the application itself. And that'll be me. Next up is Sarina to talk about how we're going to spend our total time together. Yeah, no. So we'll be discussing a little bit about the structures uh, within residence life and kind of the avenues of support that we have existing within our department. Um, we'll also be talking a little bit about the relationship between students and residence life, whether that's between them and their HA or them and their AC or all of the above, uh, as well as uh, them within housing structures and whatnot. Um, we'll also, as Cade mentioned, be talking about the housing application and navigating the portal. Cade has some really good information lined up to kind of go over what that will look like, um, visuals included. Um, and then obviously we're going to leave time for questions at the end. I know that there is a lot of questions already popping up in the Q&A. Um, when either one of us are talking, we can maybe go through and type answers to some questions that we might have. But we might wait just because what we are going to discuss might cover some of the questions that have been asked um, at this moment. Um, and so, and yeah, with that, we're going to jump into a brief overview of residence life, kind of structure wise, that Kate will kind of help us through. Yeah, I'd say keep the questions coming. We'll make sure we work through. Um, and we'll stop after every section, see if there was an applicable question that tags well with that section. And then at the end, rapid fire, happy to take those one offs as well, but try to stick to the presentation. And then if something comes up that was applicable, make sure to circle back and then big brain dump at the end. So if you can't tell, um, we're excited to meet you all. So Thinking about residence life, we are an entire group of people who have chosen as their profession or for student leaders, the way that they choose to engage in student leadership at Reed, an entire group of people who are dedicated to supporting your residential experience at Reed. So there's this whole part of your experience that is going to be the academic experience inside the classroom. And we're excited to support that. And our main professional goals are to support you when you come back and make a home in the residence halls. So for us, the difference between dormitories where people just go to sleep and residence halls where people create community are the intentional values that we work with and the support that we put out trying to connect with you. So within residence life, our values are around supporting academic excellence, community building, personal development, that would be your personal development as you live and study at Reed, collaborating with respect with each other. So learning within the honor principle to say, hey, this affected me. This is how this looked. This is how this felt. Can we engage in an honorable conversation about this? And then supporting your wellness because you are going to do so much more over four years than just study. So we want to live, we want to learn with you and talk about how to engage in being well as a community, both as an individual and as a whole. So collectively, we employ quite a few people to try to bring about um, living within our values. So at the tippy top, we have a director that oversees the entire department. 
um, supporting me as well. We have an assistant director who supports the area coordinators. So the area coordinators, Sarina being one of them, um, there are five total and they are professional staff members who uh, also live and work on campus. So if you see them around, around 11 p.m. when you're coming back from the library, that's what's up. That's why, because they're also around campus. I don't know what they're doing out at 11 p.m., but they've decided that that's what they want to do professionally is to live on campus and support the residential experience. And then the area coordinators uh, supervise the house advisors. So these are the student leaders, eventually your peers who are really excited to see you, um, who are also living in the residence halls and deciding how they want to spend their time supporting Reed is by working with you to design your communal experience. So I know your peers are really excited to meet you as well. And collectively, those director, assistant director, house advisors, the housing operation coordinator, and area coordinators, that's your web of care. So if you took nothing away from that structure, know that you are never alone at Reed. There's always someone within residence life, your HA, your area coordinator, the assistant director, the director who's waiting to make a connection. So if you're ever at Reed, you're thinking, this moment feels big, this moment feels heavy. I need to talk to someone. That's your cue reach out. Your HA is the first person to connect with. Then your area coordinator will get you connected. We'll figure out where your next step is. So Sarayan is actually going to take next lead uh, and talk about what those relationships um, with the area coordinators and HAs can and will look like. Yep, it is me. Um, so a main, um, like, let's start from the top because I, I'll get carried away if I don't. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the area coordinators are the professional staff that work directly with our housing advisors, which are, um, for any folks who might have experienced other type of university structures, a very similar title are resident assistants or RAs. Um, and so with that, we're their direct supervisors. And we, as Kate mentioned, we live on campus. Um, we live within different residence halls on campus. Our office exists within the residence halls that we supervise. Um, for context, I supervise NATO Sullivan um, and the Cross Canyons going into next year, which are both first year uh, residence halls. Uh, and so some of you might be my residents going into next year. Um, and uh, with that, my office is located within NATO. And so very much working day to day within the community Sometimes I might work out of like our dining hall just to kind of like get out and be around students uh, while I'm kind of just processing different things. Uh, and it's very similar throughout the rest of the area coordinators as well. We're very mobile um, and very active across campus. Um, so you'll definitely see us around town. Um, the other aspect of our portion is providing mainly support and advocacy for student concerns, questions, uh, experiences within the residence halls and on campus. Um, we also provide, uh, we're a part of a 24-7 emergency on-call team as well, um, where we rotate out every other week between the area coordinators, um, the deans of the institution. Um, we also have our counseling team who functions within there, um, and also our community safety officers also function uh, within that. Um, some elements within that connection portion, uh, and so where our area coordinators like work with students and connecting with students um, within various aspects, it can be social, academic, um, health and well-being. Um, some examples are like within social, I've worked predominantly with first year students since working at Reed, um, and I started here back in December of 2020. Um, and a good portion of my my position with working with first years is that kind of social transition within um, college life uh, and like living on campus. For some folks, this might be a new experience. For others, they might have experienced at another institution and the differences uh, that they might have not expected to experience can be jolting at some times. Um, and those uh, interactions can look as much as meeting in my office and just kind of chatting about your overall experience that you've had 
so far within like Reed campus. It doesn't even have to be just within the residence hall. It can be in your classrooms. It can be a passing by in, uh, situation. It can be within your extracurriculars that you decide to partake in, really anything. Um, and then something along the lines of like academic, I've had students approach me where they feel like they're maybe having a disconnect between their academics and kind of like where they were hoping to have. And I'm more of a conduit in those situations um, where I can help connect you with the appropriate like academic resources um, and uh, professional staff members within our academic support teams to make sure that you're gaining access to the most resources you can to help you kind of gain that feeling of connectedness with your academics that you're hoping to have. Um, and then health and well-being can really look as, um, can, can tie into both of those really, um, but also be within its own like existence um, in the relation of, I've helped students process homesickness before. Um, I've helped students process um, transitioning in and out of friend groups before um, because the social life standard, like within that one student's experience, um, had like friendship relationship issues and like just helping process, not necessarily in a like counselor or like therapist kind of way, but more so like in a soundboarding way of like just discussing and kind of like thought processing and think tanking those types of scenarios um, and really just helping with that processing piece. And that really can be what it look like looks like. Or even in those scenarios where it might be a little bit more heavy of content um, and working to connect them with our health and counseling center if they are needing somebody to talk to. Um, in my experience, I've even accompanied students on walks and talks so that way they can just kind of get the inside voices outside because as me, I'm an external processor and so that's something that I benefit from. Um, or even walking with them to get connected with those folks that I mentioned earlier with the Health and Counseling Center. Um, some other avenues uh, in which you might interact with myself um, other than random passing bys um is conflict mediation um this is something that might start with you connecting with your ha about it can be as simple as maybe like adapting to living with a roommate um and sharing space uh some folks have not lived with others before and so that can always be a hard transition to kind of discuss what are my boundaries. I've never really had to explore what that looks like within a living situation before. And so how do I kind of navigate those conversations? Um, some have not had to have those conversations with like non-familial or like close relations. And so how do I initiate that kind of conversation with someone who I might've just met uh, as I moved in? Um, those are some things that might start with your HA. If those things kind of tend to escalate, if like you've found solutions and you've both set boundaries within those scenarios, but they still don't seem to be working, um, or you and the indiv other individual involved in the HA are running into um, struggles trying to find a solution, that's where I might step in as like a neutral party to another neutral party and compare with the HA to kind of maybe see if there were elements of the scenario that um, I can help us like address and or like point to resources or solutions that uh, the HA otherwise might not have access to that I might in regards to my role um, and like connecting with those resources. Um, other things is like, you'll he probably get a lot of emails from your area coordinator. <laughs> um, we are in charge of dispersing larger communications um, out to the general public. And so if you're not receiving it from ResLife inbox directly, you're most likely going to be receiving it directly from your H AC, not HA, um, and your H HA, to be quite honest. Um, and so cannot emphasize enough how important keeping an eye on your read email is in terms of just also general uh, university communication. Uh, that is probably the main source of uh, communicating that we do is through like the read email. Um, and then other aspects are area-wide programming. Um, your HAs will do like more focused programming, um, but your AC might do larger programming um, for either the building and or area that they supervise. Um, and then also with like talking about buildings, facility management. Um, and so while I don't necessarily work 100% of the time directly with our facilities, I am able to connect and 
um, speak with them about building wide issues that might be going on and like work with them to make sure that students spaces are like operating properly. Um, and then uh, AODs and MAs, which are acronyms, uh, and higher ed loves their acronyms. Um, but AOD stands for our alcohol and other drug policy, and MA stands for medical amnesty. Um, and my role in these scenarios that if a student experiences uh, obtaining one of these, uh, like an AOD policy violation, um, pending what the scenario is, it might result in meeting with me to discuss the scenario. Um, one thing I really love about Reed, and it's one of the main reasons I applied to work here, is that it functions within the honor principle. Um, and that type of mentality does extend into our um, policy violation process and like procedures. Um, and so while I state like, yes, we might meet around policy violations and have these discussions around policy violations, they're not in the sense of um, like, a reprimand, like a reprimanding type scenario. Like my prerogative going into these types of conversations, and I can definitely speak for my fellow ACs in this, is not to like point fingers and say, you did something wrong or you broke the rules and for that you have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, our main prerogative is that one, first and foremost, you're okay uh, and you're being safe and that you are safe and that you're, yeah, in general, okay. Um, and then we kind of transition into a general like um, reflection of the scenario uh, and like the situation that occurred and kind of just talking about it, like what were your thoughts, like kind of going through the situation as well as like near the end of the situation and like even afterwards, uh, sharing based off of comfortability also, because I'm never gonna force a student to share what they don't feel comfortable sharing. Um, and then from there, we kind of just brainstorm ways about how navigating a campus that has certain policies and procedures, as well as like a student experience of an individual is going to choose what they are and are not going to partake and or experience within their time at college, but still understanding the impact that it might have on themselves as well as their surrounding community members. Um, and the only variance with a medical amnesty situation is that my main prerogative stays that very first portion of making sure you're safe and you're okay, um, making sure there aren't any other resources that could be provided to help uh, remain in a good state, um, and then brainstorming ways in which uh, students can remain safe if they choose to partake in any substances moving forward to not result in a medical type situation uh, resulting in the student needing assistance or care. Um, so those are some other ways in which we might interact. Um, as Kate also mentioned, and as I've mentioned a little bit, uh, we do function on call. Um, my main, or the AC's main role that if we're arriving to a situation in person on call, it usually means a student is having a mental health crisis and we're there to help support them through that process, making sure they're gaining access to resources and care um, to stay safe. Um, and that's a pretty big predominant um, role of me addressing situations in person. Um, there are also other scenarios where students request to speak to just the AC on call because that's something that makes them more comfortable to address what might be um, being experienced. And that's definitely something that we'll do and we'll communicate with them. Um, and ultimately it also, we're around to just chat as well. Um, we're never opposed to students reaching out and wanting to chat about really whatever, um, as long as you tell us what you're wanting to chat about, um, even if it's just to chat. Um, but we all are pretty open with our schedules. Um, I can speak for my colleagues in regards to like, we have book me links that are open and ready for folks. Um, to share our availability and our willingness to like just chat and meet and talk about some things. Um, and then to wrap up my portion a little bit, um, kind of going a little bit more in depth about the HAs. Um, the HAs are available as like peer resources um, for you all and like peer support. Uh, I can acknowledge that while all of these things that I said about my role and how we interact and support uh, students, 
I can still acknowledge that I'm a professional staff member and that comes with a little bit of uncomfortableness sometimes to interact and or uh, reach out, ask questions or, um, and so our hopes is that by the existence of this like peer resource and support structure that exists within an HA, it makes it a little bit easier to access these resources that we have for students and a level of comfortability that is easier for students to utilize. Um, and that could be uh, with, with our first years, our first year HAs, not our first year HAs, our HAs that work with first year students, um, they do those in the ways of having like intentional conversations for the first three quarters um, of the school year. Um, it can be anywhere between 10 minutes to an hour that really fluctuates based on the student that they're meeting with. Um, and they just kind of talk about the general experience that students are having at Reed. Like, how are they experiencing the transition? Um, are there any resources that the students might be noticing having gaps um, that are causing some issues to transition into Reed life? Um, or if there's anything uh, that the HA might have in terms of uh, resource support that maybe the student wasn't aware of that could be helpful. Um, they also provide hall programming um, specific for you all. Uh, I know a lot of my HAs work pretty directly with their students to make sure that the programming that they're putting on is programming that the students are wanting to experience. Uh, it can range anywhere from a movie night to a guided field trip downtown um, to ice cream uh, to uh, community service events. It really can has a wide range of what types of events your HA might be putting on for you. Um, and then also to reiterate, they're also there just to chat. Um, they're your peers. They've experienced what you might be about to experience. Um, if anything, they can at least share perspective of their first years at Reed. I know we have a really good bunch of HAs uh, that are going into this next school year that have a lot of experience amongst all of them. And I know a lot of them would be happy to just chat and connect. Um, and with that, I'm going to transition to Cade, and then I'm going to start perusing the Q&A to make sure there aren't anything, there isn't anything that popped up during my presentation that I can maybe type an answer for you real quick. All right. So before we leave off on what can support look like, Sir Rana spoke to um, kind of all the different ways you could connect with them or your coordinator, um, and then also connecting with your house advisors, your peer support network, your peer leader network, know that one of our biggest support networks is actually you all. So we have a neighborhood model at Reed College wherein we house first year students together, sophomore students together, and upper division students together. So you are going to enter into the residence halls and have your class, your community, all experiencing similar things, going through Hume together, experiencing those first week, six weeks and semester together. So that model is absolutely on purpose so that we can um, provide targeted and purposeful um, opportunities for connections to our incoming students um, and have them kind of succeed through their read experience. So while I absolutely would give kudos and excitement to Sarina and the HAs, I also want you to know that if you ever look right and look left, don't know who to connect with, look right and look left again, because your peer may have the answer to that question that you've been stewing over for two days. So that neighborhood model is a big piece of the support program um, at Reed. Okay, so I'm going to step away from kind of the interpersonal support and talk about some structural support and processes that you may experience during your time at Reed. So on the operations coordinator, coordinator housing operations portion of residence life, um, we've got people like myself who are coordinating move in. So really excited to welcome you here in August. Move out because you can't stay here for forever. So at the end of the year, we do close our residence halls. Um, we have a limited number of students who are staying over the summer. And those are usually international students Students who are experiencing a high financial need have internships or research with Reed faculty over the summer. But for the most part, someone's got to coordinate move out. And that's usually going to be me. Um, I'm also the person who's going to be working on your housing assignments. So when you successfully submit this application that we're going to talk about later, myself and the director are the people who are supporting pairing folks together and making sure that you get placed in places according to your preferences whenever possible. 
Also, the housing operations person is going to be subordinating room changes during the semester. So after the second week of fall semester, if you look around and say, this isn't quite comfy yet. I actually met somebody in NATO and I'm in Trillium and they weren't assigned a roommate. Hey, residence life, could I get a room change and head on over to NATO? So there's going to be an operations person who's also sporting something like that after the second week of fall semester. And then operations also supports connecting with facilities. So we're in constant conversations about what are st students experiencing in the residence halls? What needs to be fixed? What can we do better? And what does that kind of echo sound like in the residence halls? Um, and what can we do to make it better? And then housing operations also coordinates with DAR, so our Office of Disability and Accessibility Resources. So DAR is the office on campus that coordinates all of our housing accommodations. So although we call it a housing accommodation, DAR is the office on campus that supports the intake process and coordination of those accommodations. And then Residence Life implements the accommodation according to DAR's internal policies and procedures. So a lot of this stuff is invisible. <laughs> if it goes well, you'll really never notice. Um, but I do want you to know on the back end, there are some people who are looking and saying, hey, you are more than just a number. You are a student. And how can we apply our policies and procedures to support you living on campus, successfully connecting with your room, your home? That's all us, I guess, on the back end. OK, next up, um, I'm going to do a little bit of show and tell. So I'm going to click through uh, the housing application and talk through some common questions in hopes that we can get out ahead. Um, if folks have been on the portal and thought, I don't quite really know what that thing does. I'm going to walk through some of those common questions. And then at the end, that's when we'll head into questions. So let me figure out how to Zoom in 2023. Share screen. Okie dokie. Looking good. So about three clicks in, uh, you've got your student welcome, just saying, hey, hello, welcome to read. Thank you for applying. Um, you will have an opportunity to review your student information. So this is the information that the college has on you that you can manipulate in IRIS, which is the central platform um, central holding spot for your information with the college. You will have an opportunity to submit a residency exemption to our residency housing and guarantee. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And one of the first questions we get is on this disability related accommodations page. So through this page, you will want to tell us, will you be requesting a disability related housing accommodation through DAR? The through DAR is really the important operative part there. And depending on how you answer, you're going to get a confirmation email just acknowledging you were planning on reaching out to DAR or you weren't planning on reaching out to DAR. The most important thing is that you do reach out to DAR if you are planning to um, work through the housing accommodation process. So you do need to reach out to DAR. That is a separate process. We work closely with them in implementation. But as far as coordinating the intake process, that's all going to be with DAR. So know that just because you answer yes to this question does not mean everything happens through magic. You do need to reach out to DAR and continue that conversation with them. The next up is, oh, I guess it wants to kick me out. Haha, -ha, we're back. Lifestyle questions. Y'all, let's have an honest conversation because this is where you want to have an honest conversation. So these lifestyle questions are the best information that residence life has about how you like to live, how you like to be, what does home look, sound, and feel like. So I'd encourage you to be very, very honest when you're going through and answering this question, because in order to successfully place you with a roommate, if you don't find a roommate um, before we do our housing allocation, we need to know if you smoke or not because we do not want to put people who smoke with people who don't smoke. That's just not good, especially if we can put two people who do smoke together. So as you are considering these lifestyle questions, please be very, very honest with them. Know that you're going to put your best foot forward trying to connect with people who also live a similar lifestyle. 
I would say that one of my like nerdiest, happiest moments um, in placing students is that we definitely get students who are placed together based upon these lifestyle questions. Um, after students submit them, um, it gives you a percentage match with um, your potential uh, new roommate. Uh, and we get folks who have never met, never would have met, but I get placed together and are a 95% match and they become best friends because according to these lifestyle questions, they could have become best friends anyways. So as you work through these lifestyle questions, please just make sure you're considering really what are your personal needs, answer them honestly, and then we'll do our best to place you with a roommate who has compatible answers as well. Next up is personal bio, which is another step um, at the bottom of the lifestyle page. So you can put whatever you want. Um, I just put that it's important to test the application first because I did a lot of work to make sure it worked before you all started in there. Um, but you can write whatever you want. I would say that people do really look at this. So if you want to talk about your favorite band or you want to talk about rocks, I love rocks. And if I saw another person wrote about rocks, I'd be really excited to invite them to be my roommate. So Feel free to write something about yourself. It is dorky and we're kind of dorks that read. So give it a shot. Roommates. Okay, let's talk roommates. So you will see that you have the ability to search for roommates and invite people to be your roommate on the portal. The big things to know is that you need to complete this part of the process by June 1. So roommates can, this isn't quite true, I can work to add a roommate um, post June 1, but it gets very tedious. And we're on a short timeline with me trying to get out housing assignments after June 1. So if you're thinking about inviting someone to be your roommate, please, please, please do this search process and know that after you send them an invitation, they will get an email. They will also see it in their portal in the messages tab. Um, and they need to physically go back to the housing application and hit accept. So it's not enough just to invite someone to be your roommate. They need to physically go back to the portal and hit accept in order for you two to be paired as roommates when we do our housing allocation. Another thing that trips folks up uh, when they're navigating doing roommates is, my apologies, I'm gonna go back one. Huzzah. So it's actually housed on our lifestyle questions. So if you want people to be able to find you and invite you to be their roommate, you need to leave this display and roommate search results checked. If you want to set a boundary that I don't want people to reach out to me, and I just, that is not what I'm about, you can uncheck this, which means that you are not searchable in the roommates database. So again, if you want to be found, leave this checked. If you want a ghost, uncheck it and no one's going to find you. Okay. Let's go to interest-based housing. Okay, so Reed offers two different interest-based housing opportunities. One is the queer collective and one is the students of color community. So you can select on your application that you're interested in one, both, or neither. Um, if you're interested in neither, our application will just shoot you right on down to your room preferences. If you answer that you're interested in one or both, um, there are some essays that we're going to ask you to write talking about your interest and how you'd like to engage in community. So you do need to fill out those essays in order to be considered. Um, and that's the main way that we're going to be looking at that application. And I'd say that the average response um, is about eight sentences. So we do not need you to do your first Hume essay before you arrive on campus. Please don't write five pages. Um, a Hume essay is going to be longer, but you get the picture. I'd say about eight sentences. Tell us about your interest. Tell you about how you'd engage in community and sit in an odds way. And then a couple more. We're going to talk room preferences. 
Okay. All I'd really say here is that you have the ability to look at our residence hall uh, floor plans online. So you can actually go to residence life, um, residence halls, and then look at Trillium and look at the floor plan. You can look at Chittick and look at the floor plan. Same with Nato Sullivan. So as you're considering putting your preferences, know two things. Number one, we do take them into account in the housing allocation. And number two, they are preferences. They are not guarantees that just because you um, say, I want a single in Trillium, a single in Cross Canyon, and a single in Nato Sullivan, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to end up with a single. However, it does mean that you've put your best foot forward and saying that, hey, when my number comes up in the housing allocation, I've said that I want a single. If single is available, single goes to me. So that's kind of how that process works. Um, a lot of our singles are allocated through disability and accessibility resources. And then we do have a number uh, that are um, that still come through our housing allocation process. Um, I think putting your room preferences forward is your way of putting your best foot forward and know that we will do the best we can with what we have in our housing stock when your number comes up in our housing allocation. Okay. Couple more things. Let's talk meal plan. It is all right here, but I do want to reiterate it. So a common question that we get in our office is, what meal plan should I have? So I'd say almost all students coming in their first semester select meal plan A. So A is for a student who will eat almost every single meal on campus through Bon Appetit, either Commons or another one of their properties. So if you're a person who doesn't really cook and doesn't really want to cook, A is going to be your place to be. B, meal plan B, is for students who will occasionally not eat lunch, occasionally not eat dinner, um, but they're going to eat almost all of their meals through Bon Appetit. And then C is seldomly selected for incoming students, um, and that's for students who flat out do not plan to eat all of their meals from commons. So every single residence hall has a communal kitchen, so it is totally possible, and we encourage you to cook with yourself and your peers on campus, and it's a lot of folks for a single communal kitchen. So there isn't a meal plan that we offer to incoming first years that um, really allows a student to cook all of their meals in the residence halls. And to be truthful, that's on purpose. The residence halls and communal eating is there to support your academic success and to support your communal connection on campus. And if you're back in the residence hall cooking every single meal for yourself and all of your peers are in commons building those experiences, there's gonna be a detachment there. So um, A, B, or C, C for folks who wanna do the least amount of eating in commons and the most amount of cooking. A is what almost all incoming students will select. And the good news is, is that towards the end of fall semester, if you're on A and you realize, nope, I just, I just don't eat that much. I'm, I'm never gonna eat an A's amount during a semester. You can change your meal plan. So heading into second semester, you can change your meal plan, downgrade it from an A to a B or a C, head on your way into the second semester, having a better idea of exactly what your eating needs are. Okay, couple more. Excited for these questions. <laughs> Grad guard. Another question we get is, hey, Cade, you know, some people use my first name. Um, hey, Cade, should I get insurance? Cade, I am not qualified, and I would never tell you if you should get insurance or not. That is just not my role. What I can tell you, though, is that through our housing contract, we do not take responsibilities for your belongings in the residence hall. So if you leave your door open and someone steals your laptop, that is not something that's covered under liability for Reed College. So if you are looking for an insurance policy that supports if something happens to your belongings while you live at Reed, GradGuard is a way to go about doing that. It's the same calculation that I have to make um, when I get renter's insurance for living off campus. So I can't make that recommendation, but I do want you to know that if you're looking for an insurance policy that can support you while you're living on campus, GradGuard is an opportunity to do that, and it's right there in your housing portal. It is not a requirement. It is a third-party offering that we've partnered with if you do want to do that. 
And last but not least, let's talk through your housing contract. We've established that I'm a nerd and I work in housing on purpose because I think it's really interesting and I like supporting you all. Y'all, if I could give you one tip, it's read your housing contract. There are so many questions that can be answered there and reading your housing contract can leave you feeling empowered to live on campus and navigate Reed College and your living experience with power. So it is not um, nagging comes to mind to say read your contract. It is because I want you to feel empowered and knowledgeable that when you go to meet with Sarina or you talk with your HA or you talk with me about something, you know what's going on and you know what you've agreed to and what everyone has agreed to on campus because while every single individual community at Reed will make their own community agreements, the thing that everyone has agreed to is the housing contract. So if you do a room change from NATO to Chittick, great, you'll have new community norms some things to get used to, but you know that you can rely upon the guest policy in our housing contract. That's the thing that you can use the honor principle to move forward in a conversation with your peers. So please, please, please read your housing contract. Okay, last but not least, y'all, I know I've been talking at you on a lot of information. I'm going to take a break and just show you my face because you're gonna see the portal for yourself. I wanna leave you with some common policy questions um, that come up as well. So number one, our animal policy. So we are an institution that actually welcomes animals in our residence halls, but we have some limitations around congregate living um, and having animals in our residence halls. So residents are limited to one small cage per room and aquariums over 25 gallons are not permitted. So bring your fish, don't bring your shark, leave the shark at home, please. And then you need to register your pet um, with residence life prior to the pet's arrival on campus. And there's an animal registration Google form on our website. Other two things are maintenance requests. So we work with facilities. However, we are not facilities ourselves. So residents actually can get onto a facilities website from a tile on our homepage um, and submit a maintenance request for their own room. Please always remember to include your room number. Working with my colleagues in facilities, they often say that I got a uh, maintenance request from such and such. Where do they live? So if I'm Cade and I live in Shoals 309, it's really important that I say, I'm Cade, I live in Shoals 309 and my bed is broken. Please remember to, to include your room number. And last but not least, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, we do have a residency requirement and guarantee for your first two years at Reed. So there are some limited reasons why a student wouldn't live on campus for the first two years. Um, and you can submit that petition if you do fall into one of those categories through your application. So if you live, say one example is uh, if students live closer to 30 miles from campus, um, they can submit a petition to be uh, exempted from living on campus. So you would actually do that through the application process. So you still need to submit that application, letting us know, hey, this is me, this is my situation. I'd like you to consider this exemption. And last but not least, y'all, I wanna give you some tips for success, navigating read and also navigating residence life. Number one, stay attached to your email. Email is still the main form of communication that we're gonna use. We do have some social media, we do have group chats with the HAs and residents, but as far as important closing information, that's gonna come out via email. And I didn't see that email is rarely a solid excuse for something needing to be an exemption later. So keep track of your email. We'll, be, we'll do the best we can to communicate with you timely, but ultimately it is on you during your time at Reed to check your email and respond accordingly. Other things I would say is get to know your HA in the first two weeks. You're gonna actually have your first night experience with them. So you'll know name, face, pronouns in that first night, but take the opportunity to say, hey, I wanna get to know you in those first two weeks and intend, attend those intentional conversations that Sarayana mentioned earlier. So those are 10 minutes to an hour long opportunity set aside by an upper division student who has said, I wanna get to know you and support your transition to read. So attend your intentional conversations with your HAs in the fall and spring semester. 
Last but not least, I said it before, if you're ever feeling alone at Reed, know that that can be normal. Transition is a normal thing. We're all gonna go through it, all go through it in our life. As you transition to Reed, if you're ever in this moment, you're like, oh, I'm alone here. It doesn't feel right. That is your cue to reach out to your HA and reach out to your AC. The sooner you have that feeling, ping, that that's my opportunity to reach out to your HA or AC, the sooner we can connect with you and get connected with you and get you connected to your peers. The neighborhood model is there for a reason. We want you to build this incoming student um, identity and experience, and we need to know what's going on for you. So that's all I got. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it back to Sarina, who I think has been working through a lot of questions. I've seen them tip type in a way. So where do you want to start, Sarina? Yeah, no. Um, there's a few housing contract questions in there if you wanted to pop in and snag those. Um, I've been trying to cover the general consistent ones. So one that I can answer overarching is that some of our residence halls do have indoor bike storage for students to utilize. Um, and uh, students are, if space allows, able to uh, store within their own room as well. Um, I can acknowledge that if you don't, if you live with someone, that's definitely a conversation that you would want to have with your roommate as like bikes can take up a hefty amount of storage, uh, especially within some rooms. Um, and so I will mark some of those questions um, as answered. Um, there was a, a question about the housing contract in regards to certain um, certain items, Cade, if you wanted to peep those, because um, I can't remember off the top of my head um, a good answer for that. Sure, um, I'm gonna start working um, in reverse order. So how does one get into the French house? I have French as a third language and I would like to keep it up. This is so awesome. Um, so language houses are actually an opportunity going into your sophomore year. So unfortunately right. we have already made those placements for this year, um, but language houses are an opportunity for you, your sophomore, junior and senior year with preferences given to students rising into their sophomore year. So not this year, but next year. Really excited for you to be in the French house. There's a question about knives um, against the housing contract. So we do prohibit um, knives and dangerous objects not considered to be commonly pocket knives or home use knives. There's more information in the housing contract, but offhand without having a conversation with you, I'd say that type of knife probably gonna be prohibited and understood to be a weapon. However, on the honor principle, that does not mean we cannot have a conversation about it. Is it easy to get a single occupant room? It's very important to me to have a single occupant room. Talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, easy is a little ambiguous for me to answer. I'd say the vast majority of our rooms are going to be double occupancy. Something about 70% of them are gonna be double occupancy. Um, a lot of those single rooms, especially for incoming students are gonna be allocated via disability and accessibility resources. And if a single is important to you, put it in your preferences. We will offer it to you the moment the year number comes up. And if later you still need to try to change, we can work on a room change with you. It's always an opportunity to continue the conversation. Okay, let's go next. I'm gonna uh, answer a quick question. Please. Um, so someone stated, uh, hi, can you claim a private stall or will it be shared by everybody? I'm assuming this is in relation to bathrooms within residence halls. Um, so some of the questions I have answered so far is talking about how the bathrooms are structured within residence halls. Um, a majority, if not all of our bathrooms within our halls are community style bathrooms. Um, but this does not mean that you're sharing showers with folks. It's not gym style. Um, that is not what it is whatsoever. There are individual um, stalls that are able to be locked from the inside so that students do have privacy when using showers and or toilets. Um, now, how those stalls look will definitely um, fluctuate based off of residence halls. I know for Trillium, it's an actual like door that shuts and like has like one of those like push locks. Um, and then for a hall like Nato Sullivan, it's very much like a standard bathroom door. 
uh, bathroom stall door um, that like has those locks on it. Um, folks can use um, like the sinks and whatnot while folks are using the shower. Um, folks can use the toilet while folks are using the shower. It very much is a like folks can use the more open space that doesn't necessarily need privacy um, while others might be using the more private spaces. Um, I will say that at least this, the showers uh, that I have seen uh, within the residence halls that I've supervised, there is also space within that stall to like step out of the shower and like dry yourself off, put clothes on if you're not wanting to like, because some folks might feel comfortable just like wrapping a towel and like going to their room. If that's not something you feel comfortable doing, there is space within the stall to like get dressed, put clothing on um, and like dry yourself off before exiting the locked environment. Okay, I'm gonna keep working down. There was a question about submitting a letter from a psychologist in order to get a single occupant room. I think this is referring to seeking an accommodation through DAR for a single occupancy room. So again, I would say that connecting with DAR, talking about um, any medical diagnosis or disability related diagnosis, that would be the next step in pursuing something like that. Question about how soon should I choose which dorm I'm staying in? So I get the one that I want before they all fill up. Y'all love this question. So we treat every single application the same, whether it was submitted today, yesterday, or on June 1st. So as long as you complete your application by June 1st, that is the step that you need to take. You can take your time, find your potential roommate, think about the residence halls that you want to, um, live in to submit your preferences. We treat everything the same between now and then. So no rush, please don't forget, but no rush. Another question was, I wanted to request a divided double and not a regular double. How do I do this? Unfortunately, that is not a preference that we offer um, in our housing um, preferences. So the vast majority of our rooms are divided doubles on campus. It's just not a preference that we have built in. However, if you are allocated an undivided double, you can always raise your hand and say, hey, got this thing. Really hoping that we can move forward and do a room change. Not something we can guarantee, but we do always offer exactly what we have when we have it. Um, but putting it as a preference outright from the beginning, not something we offer, unfortunately. Gonna take one more, because I know we're running short on time. Um, if students don't confirm a roommate before June 1, are they at a disadvantage? Less likely to have a roommate or to be in a preferred residence? No, if you don't have a roommate and you head into the housing allocation, that is A-OK. -okay. It just means that um, if you do end up in a double, we're gonna be using those lifestyle questions that we talked about to place you with the person who's the best match for you. So no disadvantage to heading into the housing allocation, not having found a roommate. Um, I'm going to answer some real quick. Um, do, do, do. Someone asked, are there any substance-free dorms slash halls for the freshman class? Um, we have no like interest-based housing for sub-free uh, living, um, although that would be really cool. Um, but we do have sub-free spaces and clubs um, within campus for folks to like exist within and or to like interact with. Um, we have a sub-free space in our Gray Campus Center, which is a hub for a lot of our student groups and organizations um, for folks to be able to like have a lounging and like social space that will be sub-free. Um, so there are options and ways to engage in like extracurriculars and whatnot with other folks who would like to remain sub-free. Um, and then one last one, interested in becoming an HA in my second year, what can I do to increase my chances? Um, there's a lot to that question that I would love to talk more about. <laughs> I think that that's a really great first reason to like meet with your AC because we love talking to folks about this. Um, but generally there is nothing more or less that you could do during your first year that's going to like out like outrageously increase your chances. I mean, like you could do anything you would like to like kind of frame what your first year experience is going to be because ultimately we do have an understanding that for some folks, this might be their first job. Um, and or first like job search process that they go through. And so there's certain experiences that they just might not have until after they 
maybe gain this position. Um, but generally we look towards like, you know, leadership experience or like community involvement and like community building experience, um, facilitating experience in terms of just like, it could be a group project that you were a group leader on and talking about how your experience within that could be it. Um, but ultimately, even if you don't have that, we don't want that to discourage you from applying because again, it's a developmental role it comes with a lot of training and a lot of growth opportunities within it. And we don't expect everyone to have everything down for those types of scenarios. Um, All right. I think we're going to begin to wrap up a little bit. Um, I'm going to put two emails in this chat. One is the res life email. The second one is the admission email. If you ask a question and it was not answered, or you feel like you want a different answer, um, feel free to email um, either one of us. We can direct the questions to one another. Um, if you want, you know, a faster email, feel free to call the admission office and we can figure out how to get you, uh, sorry, a faster answer. Feel free to call us and we'll try to direct you as quickly as we can. Um, but thank you to Serena and Cave, Cade, excuse me, for um, hosting this and answering your lovely questions. Um, I hope everyone has a good rest of their evenings, unless you folks have anything else to say. No, looking no, forward just to having for you. you all on campus. Same, and know that we're taking all those questions in the resident type inbox. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you so much. All right. Goodbye. <laughs>